All right, there we go. There we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming out. Uh, my name is Bob, and this is my associate, Will. Uh, we are going to begin my portion of the presentation in just a moment, but what I do need is a volunteer who's going to be able to help Will with part of his presentation. Now, um, it can be anybody, anybody at all, but there are two rules. Uh, the two rules are that you must not know Will, and you must promise to take this actually seriously. So let's see, a bunch of hands, let me see a bunch of hands. Who would like to? Okay, so here are the rules. Please take this uh, piece of paper, the pad of paper, and this pen. And what we'd like you to do is to draw a portrait of a tree. And then when you're done with that, sign your name. A portrait of a tree. And you can actually go ahead and sit down. You'll have a few minutes to do this. You'll have a few minutes to do this. So go ahead. A portrait of a tree, whatever that means to you, and then sign your name. And then we'll get back to Will in a minute. So hello, everybody. My name is Bob, and I am an intuitive. Now, some people use the word psychic. I tend to think that that word is not inappropriate, but I think it also raises a certain amount of skepticism in people's minds. And so I'm not going to use that. Let's just refer to this as being intuition and intuitiveness. Now, you might ask yourself, how does all of this work? Well, the best way that I can describe it to you is that somebody has handed you a very large photo album filled with pictures of somebody's life. They're in no particular order. They are from uh, the past or the present or the future things about his uh, personal life, things about work life, pictures that are out of focus and may not mean all that much. My job as the intuitive person is to find those things that are important to you and then to relay those in the best way that I possibly can. And I'll confess that I am human. This is not a science in the traditional sense. And so I do my best to grab onto the images and the feelings and the emotions that I find, and I give those to you as faithfully as I can. And I'll tell you, I work very hard with as many people in the room. I try very hard not to get confused with all of the other energy and all of the other things that are coming my way. I sometimes make mistakes. I will also tell you that I try not to impose my own belief systems and my own bias on the things that I see. I'm human, and sometimes I make mistakes there. So this is genuinely a partnership of me working with you to see what I can see. You will need to provide the context of what these things actually mean. It is genuinely a partnership. You know, people who come up to me and they say, hey, Bob, you know, tell me my future, psychic. They get about as much back as somebody who goes up to a comedian and says, hey, funny man, make me laugh. So this is a partnership. Now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to all participate in this. I'd like you to set aside whatever you have on your laps and I'd like you to put both feet flat on the ground. I'd like you to put both hands on your lap. I would like you to join me in taking three deep cleansing breaths. Are you ready? Here we go. And out. Feeling that toxic energy just dissipating out into the room and into the ether again. Up and then all the way down. I'm feeling it. You're doing a great job. Thank you. And again, and as you take that third deep cleansing breath, I'm just going to try to see what I can see. I'm going to try to get what I can get. There are more seats down here. Please join. Please do not be shy. I will not bite. And I promise I will not embarrass anybody here today. That is my firm commitment. Please come all the way down. And I'm trying to get an image of something, somebody that I might be able to work with. I will tell you that the thing that I'm getting is something, it is somebody who has, I, I think it is somebody who has worked in a uh, medical or healthcare environment. If, if that at all resonates with you, would you just raise your hand if, if you've worked in a medical environment, healthcare, it could be working in IT at Kaiser, it could be anything along those lines. Association with healthcare. Sir, you have some association with, a, with healthcare? Can, can, can tell me what that is? Oops, it's not on. Yeah, I think it's I think it's on now. Hello. Hello. Oh, so I wrote code for a healthcare company. I'm, I couldn't actually hear that. I wrote code for. You work for a healthcare company. Code. Okay. And and how many years have you worked at a healthcare company? Like six months. 
six months. So yeah, this is rel okay. relatively recent. No, no, it was like four Kay. years ago. I'm sorry? Four years ago? Four, oh, four years. OK. Uh, is there anybody else who has another healthcare connection? Somebody who has maybe studied uh, healthcare uh, medicine or something like that, but then decided against it? Oh, you did. Yes. What was your connection? I did a, um, a security internship for a, uh, for a hospital. A security internship for a hospital. I don't think this is on. Is it? OK. Um, OK. So would you mind if I were to work with you? Would that be OK? It would be good? OK. Um, so what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to walk through the various things that, that are coming at me. And again, I'm trying to, to focus in on you. Um, what I'm seeing is somebody who has had a, a, I'm seeing somebody who has a history of being able to put other people's interests ahead of your own. And there are a couple of occasions where, I'm not sure what exactly this is. I'm, I'm not saying it was like you donated a kidney or something like this. But I see smiling faces. Somebody, you did something or had a history of doing something to help other people. It might be related to medical something or another. Have you done an AIDS walk or anything like that? Any sort of charity work? No, I've only donated blood. I'm sorry, say that again? I've donated blood. You, you've donated blood. OK. So I can definitely see. So you don't know when you donate blood where that's going to go. But I do see smiling faces and people who may not have, uh, may not have had that good a life. But somehow, I think you were literally giving them, uh, giving them some life. Um, I'm also seeing, uh, can I just ask you a random question? Does, does your address have a number two in it? Or no. In, or a previous address? I'm seeing an address with the number two. No? no. Nothing like that? Um, can I ask you, uh, do you have any jewelry or personal effects of somebody who may have passed on, somebody who may have, who have died? Do you have any personal effects? Not necessarily no. with you. So I'm definitely seeing something about uh, some personal effects. And it's possible that this is something that hasn't yet happened. But I do see you having something that was valued by somebody. And when it was passed, uh, when they passed on, somehow, and I don't know the exact circumstances, you, you became uh, the owner of that. And I see that person definitely being appreciative of, of your, your care and your love. Um, I do see you as being a very uh, sympathetic person. Um, but however, I think if you're honest with yourself, there is this selfish streak that you have every now and then. I think it surprises other people because that's not truly your character. And there's something about it when you're called on that that you sort of double down. You just sort of say, like, yeah, I kind of recognize that. And you're lower unconscious, like, but uh, yeah, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna change. A little bit of, of stubbornness. And I don't, think that that's, I don't think that's necessarily bad, but it is something that I would, uh, in, I would invite you to, to think a little bit about. Um, I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing a, a safe. And I'm, what I'm seeing in my mind is a, vi is a physical safe. I, but I'm, unless, that, unless that's right, I think it may be more of a metaphor. Do you actually have a safe at home or at work? Do you? No. So I think what it is, I think it's a metaphor. And I, I think the metaphor is for trustworthiness. And so I think, I think there's an element of you that is very trustworthy. Now, you, I, honestly, I don't think I could say that about everybody in the room. Uh, <laughs> it's a security conference. But I actually do think that there's an element about that that you are uh, especially good at. And I think you have this moral compass that you've listened to on a number of occasions. And you have occasionally doubted, after the fact, your, your ability to really have the right moral compass. But my sense is that you really do have the right moral compass. And I would, I would again, invite you to pay attention to that and make sure that you are doing what's right for the best interest of, of whatever it is that you're doing, uh, regardless of what the short-term effects might be. I think you've done that in the past, and you'll continue to do that. Um, I think there are going to be decisions that you are making that are going to cause you some and some doubt. And I think some people look back at their lives and they say, I have no regrets. And I think you're the sort of person who rolls their eyes at that. And I think you say, well, that's silly. You either weren't paying attention and aren't evolving as a person and aren't learning and struggling and adapting, or you did nothing in your life that was at all controversial. And, and therefore, it wasn't a, worth, a life worth living. And I think, that's, I think you will, are going to continue to look back at your life and have some questions about your decisions. But you, all of those decisions were the decisions that you had to make to get you to where you are here now. And that's where you need to be in order to go on to some other adventures, which I see being fairly, fairly impressive. Um, has anybody ever accused you of being a psychic or having ESP? 
I, I have, I have. Once. Once, and, and who was that person? Was that a relative? Or? Uh, no, I used to um, go to a lot of lucid dreaming conferences. Uh, some conferences, and, some, and what, so somebody accused you of having those skills. I think everybody has those kinds of skills, whether they're psychic or whether they are uh, just intuitive. I think, actually, I see you being able to come up here and do this. You're sort of looking at me, and you're, 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 you have some things that you're thinking of, too. And I think that's awesome. And I, I would encourage you to also develop all of those, those different kinds of skills, because I do believe that you have those more than the average person does. So I would encourage you to develop those. Um, I have a few other things, but I, I'm just going to stop here because I, I do want to give time to my associate, Will. Uh, you've, you've been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for participating. Give him a big round of applause. So that is a treat. You haven't seen it yet, but that is a treat. Ooh, is that better? Are we good? Are we good? Okay, good. So, just like to hand me the treat, come up with me. This is the exciting part. All right. Hey, everybody. My name is Will, and as Bob spoke earlier, you, you understood that he goes through the spiritual energies, and he is an intuitive person. I am not. Not an intuitive person. I use psychology, sociology, psychic evolution, or not psychic, but uh, psychological evolution, and a bunch of other various factors that I go through in order to interpret stuff. So... At the beginning of this, we asked a person who I generally do not know. Now, I'm going to be honest. I did interview her for a job at one point. So that being said, what I'm going to do here has nothing to do with job interviews. You'll understand in a minute. But we gave her instructions. We said, please draw a tree and sign your name. Now, it might seem odd to you that that was the only instructions that she got. But what you don't understand, perhaps, is, is that the subconscious mind is at play when creativity is involved. Okay? So when you hand somebody a blank piece of paper with a statement like, please draw a tree, there is thousands of different interpretations that any one person could do for any one tree. For example, hopefully everybody can see that, it is a Christmas tree, right? And it says, to this because it is the season, so we know why she wrote the Christmas tree, or so she thinks. Anyway, she could have made a palm tree, she could have made a pine tree, she could have made a regular old maple tree, she could have made an oak tree. There's a hundred trees she could have made, but she chose to make this tree and sign her name. So we're going to go through this and what this means from an abstract perspective. Okay. So the first thing you note about this particular tree is she had a lot of time. And I say that because she had a lot of detail. Now, normally when I do this, um, there is somebody preceding me, so I have the ability to stop them at a certain point. So you're seeing a lot of extra detail here just because she had the pen in her hand and the paper was sitting in front of her. But that does mean something. It means she's always looking to improve. She doesn't take, she's never done. You're never done, are you? Are you done? Are you never done? No. See, she's never done. That's what this says. She says, I'm never done. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to keep working on it. Um, you see a lot of very specific symbolism in this. You'll see that there's actually a gingerbread man. I believe that's supposed to be a reindeer, although it looks a lot like a bunny. Um, <laughs> perhaps a bird, but it could be a star. I didn't say she was an artist. I just said she drew a lot of stuff. <laughs> right? It's okay. So... What this tells me, and all of this detail, if you can see it, if you wouldn't mind holding this because it's getting just a little awkward for me. Okay. So if you can all see it, the, what you see in these details is, is that somebody who's really focused on family events, somebody who's really focused on the nuclear family, somebody who's focused on the parents, the sons, the daughters, the sisters, the brothers, not necessarily the extended family. And the reason that I can tell you they're not going into the extended family is mostly because out of all of this, she drew the tree, surrounding tree, and nothing else. So all that time she had to draw extra things, she stayed focused within the concept of the family tree. She never branched out of it. She's not like throwing eggnog back here and there's no like sound or music or people getting drunk. Um, lots of presents. I'm gonna say she had a warm childhood. She had a very good childhood. I mean, she, you know, Christmas to her is something she can think back on fondly. And you can say, oh my gosh, this, I had great experiences. She wants to carry this tradition on. It's something that she's trying to push into her own family. Um, we get into the signature now. Now the signature is actually there for a different reason. Signatures are about identity. This is about your past. This is about your perception of how you feel. This is about you. And you'll see it's very clear. It's actually very well written. Like most people's signatures are like doctor's signatures. You go, Whoa, and then that's all you get. This particular person decided to write it out and it's very nice and clear. What that means is, is that her identity is important to her as an aspect. She identifies with herself completely. Both her first name and her last name have equal billing, which is awesome, and that she's representing that every time she does something. Integrity. This is, a, this is somebody who signed with integrity. 
That's an integrity signature. Now, interestingly enough, it slants down slightly. And when you slant down, I don't know if you know this, but people who generally slant down when they write, when they don't have any barriers of lines, they tend to be more pessimistic people. And I'm not saying you're a pessimist. I'm saying you think critically and you're looking for faults in things. But then she follows it up by a gigantic smiley face. <laughs> so, which one do you take? Do you take the slant to down slightly? And I do mean it's a very slight slant, which just means she's a critical thinker versus this gigantic smiley face. So obviously an optimist with, who's lived in the world, really, is what that means. I mean, she's an optimist who said, you know, I'm a real person, I understand. I want to dream, but I'm a concrete dreamer, right? I, I look for goals I can achieve. I'm not necessarily in the clouds. The M is interesting because um, of the way that it swoops. It's a very high swoop at the top. And the, the very beginning letters in both are actually big and swoopy. Um, this means she likes herself. And it's just, I mean, she's just happy with herself. It's not like indulgence. It's not narcissism. It's just, hey, I like being me. I have a pretty good life. Um, what else is in here? She has a unicycle. In the history of doing this, I've never had a unicycle. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> Perhaps she has balance issues or she wants to learn to ride a unicycle. I don't know. There's even, a, there's even like animals under the tree. So I'm guessing this is, this is, we're starting to reach out into the, into the realm of me guessing, right? Like before this was all like good concrete science stuff. Now I'm wondering and guessing, but I'm guessing you have farm in your history, animals in your history, some sort of caring for animals in your history, not like a traditional dog, but more advanced than that. So is it, was that a correct guess or no? No, oh, it is a dog. No, and she's just not really good at drawing dogs. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so you have a little wind-up toy. That's pretty awesome. Uh, anachronistic. You don't see a lot of wind-up toys. Jack in the Box. Jack in the Box wind-up toy. But it's very traditional. We're looking at very traditional type Christmases. Probably, uh, I like the star too. The star is also very traditional. I don't know if you realize this, but the five-pointed star actually came into being for, for people long after. This was the traditional that used to came out of the Middle of Europe in the Middle Ages. This is what they did. Um, so I, this speaks to tradition to me. It speaks to a good family history. Um, it speaks to having a lot of things to look back on from her generations, her grandparents, her parents have done things. It's an accomplishment. Um, it's a very tall tree. She used a lot of space, which means that she's very comfortable in taking control. Uh, people who aren't very comfortable in taking control, they don't use the whole space. They just like, pick an area and be like, I'm going to draw my tree. And they leave the rest of it blank, but she didn't do that. So, um, so that being said, how, how good did I do? You did pretty well. Um, I'd like to add something about the optimism and pessimism part of it. Um, you know, the whole glass is half full or is it half empty. If somebody were to ask me that question, I would say, it depends. What do you mean, it depends? Well, if, if I have an empty glass and, and Will pours me a drink halfway up, I'll say the glass is half full. But if somebody hands me a, a full glass of a beverage and then I drink half of it, then I say it's half empty. So remember when I said she had this, this was critical thinking here, this little downward slope? <laughs> she just proved it. All right, thank you very much. Everybody give a wonderful round of applause. The drawing, if you'd like. If not, it's okay. All right. So there it is, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to give Bob, Bob, huge round of applause, right, for his demonstration. Thank you, Bob. All right. Thanks for everybody for coming in. Shall we come clean? We shall come clean now. I don't know. Shall we? I don't know. Do you want to know how we did it? I think they're willing to give us money. Yeah. No, I think I think we, we should we just keep going. We just keep. Does anybody want like a psychic reading for five bucks, ten bucks, ten bucks? Anybody? <laughs> no. All right. All right. Well, I'm I'm not a psychic. No. I'm sorry. So it turns out, it turns out that we had different systems. And uh, Will called me up and he said he wanted to do this, this talk. And I said, yeah, yeah, I suppose uh, we could do something. And he said, how about you do one persona, one kind of psychic reading, and how about I do sort of a completely different kind? Uh, how about you do the one that you like to do, which is sort of based on the pseudoscience of, of energy particles going through uh, time and space. And I love to talk about that stuff. Uh, why don't you do that, Bob? And I'll talk about the psychology of uh, the things that people leak when they start to draw. And that's what we came up with. So maybe, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the similarities and differences. So similarities, right? So the interesting thing about this talk, and the reason that he and I like it so much, is that we use the same techniques in both talks, like, or in both demonstrations. And you might not have realized it because they look so much different, right? So one of the things they share in common is building rapport by getting buy-in, right? So you notice very early we said, hey, 
who wants to volunteer, right? Because somebody who's eager is going to work with you, right? You don't want somebody who's like, no, I don't want to do this. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it fine. Because that guy's not going to be fun to work with. You're not going to do it very good. So you're always looking for the right mark. And the mark is the person you can build rapport with. And building rapport starts with a request. Somebody acquiesces to your request, they're going to acquiesce to the next one, assuming it's not too far out of norm, right? It's not like you can say, hey, will you hand me that glass of salt? Now kill the president. That doesn't work. But hey, if you hand me a glass of salt, and oh, by the way, this is delicious, would you like a bite? And oh, now you, know, you can build this rapport, you can give this interaction. So Bob did that, I think. If you, you know, he did that by saying, hey, can I work with you? Do you mind if I work with you, right? He was getting that buy-in from the individual. Mine was purely in the volunteer stand up and you know, draw the tree thing. Um, Barnum statements. Barnum is by far my favorite character in history. Um, Barnum is responsible for the saying, uh, there's something for everybody. That was his circus saying. Um, he's, he's responsible for creating these very, Barnum statements or the four effect are essentially the, this process of saying something very generic that sounds really, really applicable, right? So when I said, like, when I was giving my talk, I said something along the lines of, you are probably a pretty happy person, but occasionally you get sad. I mean, I said it differently, obviously, during the talk, but that's essentially what I was saying in layman's terms. Who isn't happy and sad? Who exactly in the world isn't that, right? But everybody is that. So that's what I do, but the way I say it makes it sound like I'm saying it directly to you and it's about this situation and you understand it. And it's your brain's ability to do that. So, body language. We both use body language. Now we use body language because we're looking at you to try to determine whether or not you are gonna work with us, right? So you'll notice that the front rows are mostly empty. So you have to work with the next row. You notice I took the one in the third row, right? Third row, that's somebody who's here for the talk, who's pretty eager. Um, she raised her hand multiple times. She, it even said you don't even know Will and she raised her hand again anyway. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's, that's my, yep, we're working with her. Like she's here to play. Um, I don't know, Bob, you want to go through some of the body language you saw that made you pick your target? I um, well, so in, in my particular case, are we going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about shotgunning in the next one. So, oh, okay. we'll, we'll so, talk about that so all right. So, so the body language to us is very subtle. It's all about how you're sitting. It's all about the tension you carry on your shoulders. It's all about how we can look at you and determine what your emotional state is purely from the carriage of your physiology. And based on that, we can make some deductive assumptions. Right. The one thing I would say is that um, between, between these two individuals, I chose you so I could project myself to the audience. If I was doing this, that wouldn't have been the right sort of blocking and dynamics for the room. Oh, okay, it, it might have been actually a better presentation. I don't know you. It might have been awesome. But I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to project myself, myself and my authority this way. And so I would have preferred somebody here, but you are awesome. You're right in the middle. Perfect. Good call. Rainbow Ruse. Rainbow Ruse is a status of language that is most often used in horoscopes. In fact, if you really want to know, 90% of my presentation was just a Rainbow Ruse over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again, right? And it goes back to um, things when I was stating things like, you, you had a very rich childhood. What does that mean? You have a very rich childhood, right? You have a very rich childhood and, and you're concentrating on family and yada, yada, yada. I mean, these things are pretty typical statements that anybody could make in the rainbow ruse, but you attribute them to yourselves immediately because you self-identify as the rainbow ruse. Preconceived notions. Uh, well, preconceived notions we used in two ways, right? One was we used the spiritual talk. If you have a modality of the occult or you tend to feel that the spiritualism is something that you find affinity towards, then you would have identified with Bob. Um, and I use the psychological persona, which is a different preconceived notion. Whether or not you believe that psychology can do what I said it could do, that's a preconceived notion, right? You came in, you either decided it could or it couldn't, and then I either proved or didn't prove it to you. But your preconceived notion colored what you were doing there. Um, pretexting. Funny, I should talk about preconceived notions and then talk about our particular m personas because pretexting is the ability to lie within the context of a story. Right? So we created personas as a pretext. I created mine saying, well, I've studied and I have a PhD in various psychological disciplines that allow me to interpret you like Sherlock Holmes. Not true. But the pretext, the words that I used and the attitude that I carried it with did come off. Yes, you have a question, sir. Uh, how do you distinguish between the pretext and the pretext? I'm sorry, I'm 
Yeah. No, pretexting is the ability to create uh, 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 a pattern that is believable, that fits within their ideology. Rapport is getting them to believe that persona and being able to leverage that rapport in a trust factor to get them to behave more and more and more and more and more into your favor. Um, you're gonna get some really interesting presentation styles because Bob and I are completely different. Um, <laughs> so the blame game, this is like the worst thing in the world, the blame game. Um, the blame game is it's hard and it's your fault, right? It's hard being psychic. It's so hard being psychic. It's so hard being a guy who can like look at the tree and read your personality. It's hard. It's so hard. And the only reason I can't do it is because you aren't trying hard enough. You're not thinking enough, right? You're not remembering the thing I want you to remember. It's there. You're failing, right? I wish you could remember. It'll come to you. Two weeks later, you're going to come up to me and you're going to say, oh, I remember now, and it was this. That is the blame game. It's never our fault. It's always your fault, right? And you remember, for her in the blame game, it was the drawing of the animals, right? Like, that was me building rapport with the audience, right? It was getting you to laugh when you were laughing and she was laughing with me, and I was like, that's not really a dog, is it? And so that was me doing the very same thing of blaming the, the, the person. Oh, am I doing shotgunning? You should do shotgunning, but all right, fine. No, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they, they, they're, they're different systems. They're entirely different systems. And one of the differences in this system in, in, for a crowd is the shotgunning technique. And so Bob did the shotgunning technique as essentially throwing out generic questions until someone raises their hand and says, oh, my gosh, that sounds like me. Um, so in the case, this case, he was using the medical field, right? Like, who, and, who and, and can I can I ask how many of you actually fit that mold and did not raise your hand? Because I'm not going to call you, but there's no way that none of you has connections to the medical field. There's no statistical way. It sounds like okay, we got one over here, we got a few over here. Okay, so it's one of those things that sounds like it's not going to be statistically likely. It turns out it's such a big hit. Everybody has some connection, and if I were to spend more time widening the circle. I would have found basically everybody would have been raising their hand. But it, it looks like it was. Yeah, so it, you don't think about it, right? In critically thinking, you think, well, there are a lot of hospitals, and everybody has to go to the doctor. So I'm pretty sure everybody has in, you know, impact, you know, dealt with medical stuff in their life. But you don't think that way. We're taking advantage of that. So uh, getting anyone who fit the mold to be the, the, the volunteer, that was Bob was explaining. He was widening his circle. So he did it last night. It was actually pretty funny. Um, I'm just going to do it because it was so yeah. funny. Uh, he, was, he was trying so hard to get somebody at dinner to, to find somebody in the medical arena that they knew. And he was trying very, very hard. And by the end of it, he was like, it could have been somebody who volunteered at a tent during Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah. he may have seen a give blood sign from the Red Cross on the corner. Like mm -hmm. anyone. But that's what that is. And we'll just keep making it bigger. The context will keep getting wider until we find somebody who's like, yeah, that's sort of, I can sort of relate to that. And then we just jump all over them. And they're our favorite person in the world. Um, starting with a win. Remember when I said that uh, we ask you to do something first? That is a win from our perspective. If you are taking direction from us, we are in control. If we are in control, this might go well. Notice I said might. Um, so building rapport is a lot about getting people to do stuff for you and having them want to do it. So when you start with a win and you make that win a positive thing, then they continue to want to participate. Um, so when you get into the intimate session, uh, my session, right, uh, certain things come, come into play, like micro-expressions and subtle expressions come into play. Obviously in a crowd scenario, like somebody in the back, if Bob was performing and somebody he was working with somebody in the back, I couldn't tell whether or not you subtly frowned. I mean, mm -hmm. and to me, you just look like a face way back there. So when you get somebody up close and personal, you can look for subtle micro-expressions and subtle expressions. And those are emotions that flicker across an individual from a subconscious perspective before they get locked down from the conscious perspective. They happen in about a tenth of a second. Um, to give you an idea, if you were to snap your fingers, they'd be gone before you finished. Like before you heard the sound, that's how fast they go by. So it's something you have to really study and something you have to really focus on. Um, and I don't recommend anybody go do it because it's not really all that valuable unless you plan to do what we do, uh, and then it can be terribly valuable. Uh, rapport, direct rapport versus crowd rapport, right? His job was to win you all over and make you all think that you know this was gonna be a positive experience. My job was to not alienate the person who was helping me. <laughs> That's literally my job when you're dealing with that, right? So you notice I brought her up, and leave her sitting there, I brought her up. And first, 
I was this big center of attention and I held this big thing up, right? And I was referring to it like this, leaving her out of it, right? And eventually I handed it to her, right? And she took it. Remember the win? Huh? You're doing something for me already. So she's taking it and she's holding it and she's looking down on it. And at this point, she may have been doing this before, but this is when I noticed, she started nodding, right? FYI, if you're dealing with psychics, don't nod. We love it. It's great. We know we're on the right track. We don't have to do anything else. We can just keep claiming the win. But anyway, so she started nodding, and that's when I started building rapport with her and going over her drawings. And she seemed, based on what I knew of her, I knew she was a pretty robust individual, and so the slight general ribbing I was giving wasn't going to upset her, right? So you'll notice that's how we built direct rapport, but at the same time, I built crowd rapport, right? Because you guys were like, this is entertaining. It's kind of funny. I'm not bored. So it's a very delicate balance between, hey, let's build a rapport and this is fun and have it be entertaining enough for you guys to be like, yeah, I'm going to still pay attention. Um, empathetic references. Empathetic references are some of the very beginnings of building a rapport. And empathetic references are where you make a statement of a sympathetic nature towards an aspect of their personality or their history or whomever. Um, in my case, it was I kept using the word warm. I don't know if you noticed that, but warm is an empathetic statement. It's warm, it feels warm, you had a warm family. Warm, warm, everything I did around my empathetic statement was a very positive message about the warmth and the happiness because she drew a freaking Christmas tree and said it's the season, right? Why else did I talk about family and warm, right? So that's sort of the empathetic statement references. If, I, if you have any questions, just stop us. Okay, so a little bit more of a deep dive, and we covered a little bit of this uh, before, but Barnum said uh, he liked his, uh, his shows to have something for everyone. Um, and these are such awesome statements because they, they actually are crazy vague, but if you are in the right frame of mind, you will then tie that back to something that is specific and relates to you, and we all fall for this. Um, so when I said, uh, uh, you, know, you, you might say something like, you have a strong need for people to like and respect you, well, you're not really human if you don't have a need to connect with other people, and this is a very, very common way in which people like to connect. Um, I would caution people to use the Barnum technique uh, a little bit sparingly because it is so widely recognized, and so you have to be very strategic about the ways in which you use that. So uh, the best psychics actually aren't really vague. They're actually crazy specific. They will give you something that you couldn't possibly know, if it, is a, if it is a hit, it is the sort of jaw-dropping experience that you then call people and say, like, I don't think the psychic stuff is real, but she told me this, and there's no way she could know. And that's what builds repeat customers. Um, if, you, uh, if you just use all of these vague things, that's really no better than the horoscope. So the best psychics will use a series of other techniques that we're going to be talking about to really, uh, to really catch you. Uh, so we talked about the rainbow ruse, and so this is simultaneously crediting somebody with one trait and then its exact opposite. And so I think I said something about how you're, you're generally a very giving person, and, uh, but if you're honest with yourself, you have this selfish streak which goes through you. And I saw your face go guilty. <laughs> I saw guilt all over your face. And how could it not? Because that's everybody. We all go into selfish mode. We can't give 100%, 100% of the time. So how could that not be the truth? And yet, you might have actually thought of a specific thing where you're like, oh, busted. I don't know what that thing was. And my next technique, if we had a much longer session, is I would ask you what it is. You would then leave the session thinking, I knew that thing. I might actually use that later in the session as, as a callback, claiming that I just, I just saw it also. So that's another, that's another great technique. Um, so yeah, uh, again, you've got this selfish streak going through you. I think I said literally this. <laughs> oh, flattery. Oh, flattery. Did you, I didn't really do a lot of flattery because I knew that it was, it was going to be in Bob's presentation. Um, so you notice, Bob, you know, you're, you're a very good psychic. You have that kind of, you have those things, right? I feel this in you, right? Who doesn't want to be flattered? Seriously. Like, on, like, like, not necessarily flattered, like, you know, like women get like, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Nobody wants that flattery. No, nope, nobody does. No, it's not good flattery. But flattery that's subtle, flattery that looks like, and it's all about the delivery, right? It looks like we're talking to you like, hey, man, you know, I honestly believe you're a good person. And you've got great skills. And you've been so awesome 
and working with me. I mean, I just haven't had this experience with anyone else. I mean, it's been a long time since I've done this, and you're just an amazing subject. Did you know that you're you're just amazing? Like that, that level, that level of all of these things. I mean, who doesn't like that? And that, it's hard for us to stop being happy when somebody does that for us. It's hard. You have to really put a psychological block up to go, you are buttering me up, right? And if you think about the context, the only time you do that is when you're dealing with a salesman, right? Or somebody who wants something from you. Then those guards go right up, right? When the sales guy comes out and shakes your hand and pumps your hands, he's like, hey, how's it going? You look really great. I bet you have a great weekend. Let's get you into this car. You're like, yeah, yeah, shut up, right? But in the sight of a context of that we're doing, right? We're not selling you anything that you're aware of. So when we give you flattery, you just go, oh, yeah, I, I, I could see that in myself. I'm so happy you saw that. I'm, I'm so pleased. And then it helps build rapport. Um, we're all delusional. We all think we're the best at everything we do. Like if we're going to do it, like if I say, what are you good at? You believe that you are the ten, top 10% in whatever it is you think you're good at, right? The only people who don't think this are sports people because the top 10% are in the pros and they're not. But other than that, like if, if you're a coder and I say, how good of a coder are you? You're gonna say, eh, I'm pretty good. But in your head, you're one of the best because why else would you do something you weren't good at? Really, I mean, honestly. Well, I really suck at it, <laughs> let me do it anyway. Um, so if we, go, if we extend that out to the psychic metaphor or even to my metaphor, um, you see how the flattery starts embedding itself into the psychic credit. So at one point we're blaming you. So this is like a great game. Think about it, it's good cop, bad cop from the same person, right? <laughs> On one hand we're going, well, I couldn't get that because you weren't thinking hard enough, but you know you have amazing psychic gifts. We just have to work on those. And if you spend more time with me, I'm sure we can get you to the point where you'll be happy. Right? So that's what this is. We remember the hits and forget the misses. Because you only remember, your, your brain is a psychological association engine. Your only goal is to survive. So if you're walking down the street and there's a tiger, you'll remember the tiger. You do not remember the bush the tiger was hiding in. Same thing. Right? You remember the hits because they're important to you. You forget the misses because they don't matter. Okay, the, uh, the Jacques statement. I think this is one of my favorites, and I, I wish I had more time to do that because this is one of these things that really starts to get creepy. So this, it turns out that there are well-known predictable crises that we all go through in life. And to simply list these, uh, to, you know, if you can sort of get a rough age guess for this person, you can then start listing off all of these normal crises. And it turns out there's a book that uh, you can get the 30th uh, anniversary edition, and I highly recommend the 30th anniversary edition. It's called Passages by Gail Sheehy. You look it up. Uh, I thought I discovered this like by accident. It turns out it's a classic. Everybody's got it, whatever. Uh, but basically, she goes through each of the various age groups and then describes what problems people have. So entering adulthood, you're in your early 20s. You, uh, you have all this bravado and you think you own the world, but you've got this underlying doubt that you're going to make it and you still feel like a child. Boom, gotcha. Um, moving into shaping your dreams, you're in your, uh, you're in your 20s. You're starting to make a name for yourself. You're starting to make some decisions, but you don't have to make a lot of the really big decisions just yet. And you're wondering if you're really on the right track. Uh, later, as you get towards your uh, 30s, you start wondering, did I make the right decisions earlier in life? I mean, did I set myself up for failure? Should I have gotten married earlier? Should I have not gotten married? Should I have bought the house? Should I have not? You start questioning every single major life decision that you had. You can't not do this. Uh, as you get a little bit older into the 40s, you start seeking your identity. You start trying to figure out uh, more about the time you have left in life than the time that you have uh, uh, you know, before you. And you start making certain decisions about who you want to be. Revitalization when you're between, uh, I think it's 45 and, and 55. These are the kinds of things where you're, you're sort of coming uh, into your own again. And so you're finding this new love of life. And so you'll see all sorts of things uh, that go on in people's lives around here. Um, and she also in the forward, uh, yeah, revitalization. So uh, she in the forward talks a little bit about the, the changes that she has seen since she wrote the book 30 years ago. And she talks about how these days, you still see a lot of these, these same trends, but what you see is people having multiple lives within their same life. And so they have rebirth much faster than we had back in the 70s and 80s. Um, I really, I recommend this book. I especially recommend the, the forward to the 30th anniversary edition. But this is classic cold reading. 
and you can do some devastating things with armed with this. Please don't be mean to people. Um, greener grass. Um, so, of course, we always wonder about the decisions that we've had. We wonder about the path not taken. Those of us who sit typing all day wonder, maybe I should have done something with my hands. People who are uh, laborers, they may think, maybe I should have done X, Y, and Z. And we all do this. You can't not do this. And the psychic will use those kinds of, uh, that knowledge against you. I, I'll bet you, I see something about, I see something about, did you, did you meet, did you want to apply, did you want to submit that, uh, a talk to a conference? Was there something like that? Did you, you did, you, yeah, so were you questioning the decision to do it or to not do it? All you need to do is get a hook onto something that was important, and then you can ask if they had doubt about that. There's absolutely no doubt that they will wonder about that, especially in the, in the aggregate. Uh, we move on to systems. So systems, um, this is an important thing, and uh, in mine it was a little subtle. So a psychic needs a basis for having this knowledge. It's very difficult to convince a crowd that you can just pull stuff out of the ether. And so what I need, generally speaking as a psychic, is something like tarot cards or your palm or astrology, psychometry, do you know what that is? That's where if I hold, I, can I have your keys, sir? And I will hold your keys and I will say, uh, the person who these belong to is basically an honest person. Um, I'm seeing, uh, and then I can go from there. So I have the vibrations from the thing. And so it's not me if I'm wrong, it's what's coming from me. I'm simply faithfully representing what I'm seeing from the, the tarot, or the cards, or the palms, or the, you know, the keys. It's not me if I'm right. Obviously, it's my powers that are, that are channeling this. So I get all the credit, and I get none of the blame. Um, and so in my presentation, it was a little bit hard because I really was trying to channel those, those psychics who, who really have less of a system. But generally speaking, uh, you'll, you'll want to have a system. Um, I went to a performance once. There was a woman in San Francisco who did psychic stand-up comedy. And I was so in love with this performance. She got up and basically she had the gift of gab. She just talked, you know, you know all these people, so you know, they get up and they just talk and it's just interesting. And then she would do some psychic shit. And it was awesome. She would get up and she would say, uh, you know, you sir, would you come up here on stage with me? And she would hand him an empty box of Captain Crunch. And she said, would you tear that up for me please? And put the pieces on the ground. And he did that. And she said, well, let me tell you, from the clustering over here and the clustering over here, I would say that you are largely organized. Um, but if you're honest with yourself, there are some places where it's just a complete clusterfuck. What, you know, what, what is that about? She goes, well, you know, my taxes. And she said, exactly. And what I think, and she just owned that. <laughs> right it. She owned that. She said nothing. Boom. She also had a binder full of song lyrics. And so she would say, uh, you know, you, may I work with you? And here's this binder. What I want you to do is don't look at it. Turn it upside down, actually. Just flip through the pages, pick one. And then, and then what is that? Oh, it's uh, pictures of you by the cure. Let me tell you about that, that sad breakup that you went through. Because you were devastated. I mean, absolutely devastated. You just run your hands down. Stop. What is that line? Read that line out loud. Oh my god. Oh. And then she would just go into the interpretation of that. She had a system I'd never seen before that was genius. Um, and really, you can make up your own. Anything that's going to capture the imagination and allow you to take credit but deflect the blame. Uh, when things go wrong. Well, we could talk for hours about this one. Uh, but the, the trick here is I want to turn all of my misses, of which there are going to be a lot. The best psychics have, a, you know, I don't know, 1% track record, 5%. Yes. Speak. They're, they're terrible. The best people are just not that good. So the question is, why do we think they're so good? And the answer is that they know how to turn misses into hits. And so part of this is the blame game, but some of these strategies are a little bit more sophisticated. So um, I would say, uh, yeah, uh, you know, you've just, you've just forgotten. I actually did that about last night at dinner. I said to somebody who said something, I, I just wouldn't let it go. I said, nope, this is true. This is a true statement about you. This is a true statement about you. And tonight you'll have a dream, and you'll come in in the morning, and you will rush over to me, and you will tell me the story of what you forgot. Turns out that actually happened. He came over to me this morning and told me that what he had forgotten, and he couldn't believe he had forgotten it. And it turns out that psychics rely on this. They rely on the fact that they will blame you. It's not me. It's you forgetting. Um, it may be that you don't know yet. Oh, you don't know that this bad thing is about to befall you, or that this person really did think that you were awesome. 
Uh, so that's another one of these great techniques, or that nobody knows. Um, it may be that you're just too embarrassed to tell me, or that you're too embarrassed to really let that surface. There's something deep down inside, you just haven't come to grips with it, but I'll be patient. I'll be here for you next week. Um, or that'll be in the future. So this is one of my favorites. It's like, oh, so you, you don't have a two? You don't have a two? It may be a previous house? No, it, this may be a place that you are going to move to. <laughs> and so I might then move, and then, so sir, are you actually thinking of moving? Or have you moved recently, are you thinking of moving? And if that's at all a hit, how did he know I was moving? And he said to keep out, keep a lookout for a place that has, that has a two in it. Um, or that I'm right emotionally. Um, expand the scope. And so I had a psychic do this to me, and, and we were talking at lunch about whether or not she did the right thing. So she said uh, uh, something, it was something like, uh, and I'll just sort of, uh, uh, sort of summarize this, like there's something, with your, there's something with your toe. No. No, you have, there's a problem with your toe. Uh, no, no, never had a problem with my toe. It's uh, somewhere in the foot area. So what she's done is she's taken this miss and she's expanding the scope. She's turned it into my foot. No, surgery on my foot, no. Now if she hit a hit, I'd be like, how did she know I had surgery on my foot when I was nine? How, she knows. But no, it turns out for me that wasn't good. She stuck on foot and said, she kept blaming me, it's the foot and you just don't know, you don't remember or whatever. And that's how she ended it. I'm not so sure that was the best approach. The approach I might have considered would be to keep moving. So maybe it's not about the foot. Ex the, the, it could be is walking. Do you have a problem walking? Because at that point, oh yeah, I actually have some lower back pain every now and then. That would have been a mild hit that she could have turned that into. You have a question? So how did you decide when to stop? The, we had this debate at lunch. Uh, it's not entirely clear to me. I think this gets to your, perfect, uh, your, your personal comfort zone. I think that's the best I can say what your technique is. Do you feel comfortable confronting somebody on a regular, like actually pushing them, telling them that they're wrong? I mean, you can be nice about it, but, but forcing it. Or do you feel more comfortable widening the scope because you're gonna get a weaker hit, right? And so I think that's, uh, I think that's personal style. Um, I, I think she should have gone for lower back. She should have said, well, guy in the middle ages has probably got a lower back problem. I'll turn that into a mild hit and then move on. Um, but, but she didn't. All right, so psychic readings are a form of social engineering, right? Just an entertainment form, and in some cases, it's a grift form, depending on how they're in employing it. But these techniques that we used, these building of rapport, these, these language tricks, these cognitive biases that we use, um, this is how I apply them to my social engineering when I've decided that I want something. Um, the first thing that I have is hyper-awareness. And what hyper-awareness means is, is that I'm pretty sure you all know how to look with your eyes, but I'm fairly certain none of you had learned how to look with all of your eyes. And that is to say that for the most part, hyper-awareness is the ability to perceive things out of your peripheral vision and key off of them because you know they're important. You'll actually see me, like I'll be in the middle of something, in the middle of a party, doing something, blah, 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 and something will happen and you will watch me do this. Oh, no, that's really great. Wait, what did you just say? And it's that peripheral vision that that's, I've seen something I want to key into, and now I'm going to attach to it and do something about it. So I use my peripheral vision on that, um, and, and it's, a, it's, a it's a huge skill to have. Uh, look for changes and ignore the static, the relaxed observer. This is another technique where um, you'll just sit and watch, and you'll notice that when you sit and watch crowds or rooms or interactions, they have some sort of flow to them. They're, they're sort of interactions, because people are herd animals in their socials, and so they build in little groups and they'll do stuff. And you can actually see when the mood changes, when the attitudes change of the, it, of the situation. Um, you can see when, the, when, when even the, the groups are moving, right? Like, so like one group is now moving to like go to the kitchen or something. These are, all, these are all changes. You don't have to pay attention to people who are standing there having a conversation, right? Because they're not moving, they're not doing anything. So you're really waiting for the change. So those two things combined. Um, acting. Uh, there is an old saying, which is up there, absolutely be absolute. What that means is, is that I don't care what you think. I know I'm right. That's it. That's all. You just have to know. You have to be 100% sure that what's coming out of your mouth is right, even if it's not. And if you don't have that level of conviction, right, it's also called faking sincerity, in case you were wondering, people read you immediately and it's like, yeah, you don't even believe yourself. I don't believe you at all. So I don't know if you got that vibe from either one of us while we were standing up here, but we 
notice we didn't question it. Like, I was working with her. I was like, no, you, you drew this for this reason, and that's why. Like, I and there were not a lot of options where I went, am I right? But I didn't ask that a lot, right? Because I was very definitively doing what I was doing, because I know, right? So that's, that's selling it. Um, be opportunistic. Uh, look for changes as above. Um, I love the big breath example. The big breath is awesome. The big breath comes in two reasons. One is it's about to tell you a really long story that you probably don't want to hear anyway. Uh, and second, it's somebody who's about to let out a big sigh. Uh, either way, stepping in gives you the opportunity to, um, to just like, somebody's taking that big breath just to be able to go, so anyway, and you just don't, you've just completely derailed them. It's now your conversation, right? Unless they happen to want to hone in on it. Um, tell people obvious things about other people. That's one of my favorites. Um, you know, John's really kind of tense. Is he really? Yeah, I've noticed that about him. That's it. You'd be amazed how many times you can do that, and people will start to akin you as being the social, like the social guru, right? Like, well, he, have, he has the pulse of the, of the company. He knows what's going on. No, he walked up to me about an hour ago and said, I'm having a very stressful day. That's it. Then somebody walked by, he's stressed. But, um, uh, once you have report, you can start influencing. Now, you can't start influencing without rapport unless you have a higher social currency. What this means is, is your boss can walk up to you and say, do this report. But you cannot walk up to your boss and say, do this report. That's literally what it means. So you have to build a rapport so that you can start doing it. You can't walk into your boss and go, so I'm not really sure how to do this, boss, and I think you'd do a better job at it. Do you have time to do at least a first draft so I know what you're thinking? That's building rapport and getting them to do something. You just can't order it. So. All right, so we've got nine minutes. So let's, uh, let's jump into. Uh, yeah, you want to do this one? So uh, we're running short on time. Yeah, let's do this one, and then we can move um, through the cognitive biases. Fairly yeah, fairly. so just real quick out of this one. We're running out of time, so I'm going to do it real fast. One of the things that people will notice about me, and I'm about to give something away, so my friends are going to start going, aha, now I know you do that, you sucker. Um, I ask very pointed questions about things that they've said. You'd be surprised how often this turns you into the best uh, conversationalist you have ever met. Like somebody will say something. Like I was doing it last night with Violet. I don't remember what she said. She said something, and I went, so wait, explain that to me in greater detail. It doesn't matter if I understand it or not. The fact that I've said, no, wait, no, I'm interested in your opinion. Please explain it to me. This means that that person is now like, yes, I, you, you, you are interested in me. And you can use that active listening, is what it's called, to get yourself uh, good rapport. So cognitive biases on. You can't skip cognitive biases. Cognitive biases are the biological examples of why our brains take shortcuts. Um, literally, if you were to process absolutely every piece of data that came into your brain, we would all short circuit, have big uh, synapses failures, and die. I mean, you just process so much data. So. As I was describing before, when you're walking down the street and you're attacked by a tiger, you remember the tiger, not necessarily the street, right? That's what these cognitive biases are. They were introduced by Amos Tversky and Daniel King in 1972. If you go to Wikipedia and you type cognitive bias, you will end up with a huge list that's not inclusive. Um, they are ways for us to take advantage of your national evolutionary psychology and make us win. That's all that is. Um, too much here. Way too much. Uh, these are just examples. We've done enough of that. Uh, although asymmetric insight is awesome. Uh, confirmation bias. Um, so confirmation bias is is really what the, when we were doing the shotgunning and he was saying, hey, does anybody here have somebody who works in the medical field, anybody who's related to the medical field? That's a cognitive bias question. Because the minute you say, oh, I do, you've just made this cognitive bias that he was talking about you. Well, you he was, mm -hmm. right? So you're, you, you're automatically interpreting what's coming out of us and saying, how does that apply to me? If it does apply to me, am I going to respond to it? Right, that's just a natural function you're doing. So, ah, that's Okay, your so uh, your cognitive biases. So obviously we're here to talk to you about why sitters, uh, so we, did we define sitters? We didn't define we sitters. Didn't define so sitters. there's the psychic and then there's the sitter who's the, the participant or the client or the customer or whatever. Um, and so we, we talked a little bit about why the sitter might find uh, these shortcuts useful and why they might be looking for various patterns. Um, but you have them too, and you have them all the time. And so uh, without going into too much detail, you probably do these at work. And if you can start to become aware of other people doing it, please be aware that you are doing it too. So uh, the, you know, the jumping on the bandwagon, we do this all the time. Or uh, you know, thinking that your group, your particular division, your particular group is better than others, that is a cognitive bias that's probably not based in reality. They think the same thing. Um, Negativity bias. We tend to listen to people who have a contrarian point of view more than, than, is, than the evidence would warrant. And so be aware that somebody who shoots something down 
may have the uh, uh, they may have your ear a little bit more than is statistically uh, or rationally uh, relevant. Uh, so we can talk a little bit about this. So uh, uh, apophenia, pareidolia, and patternicity. So these are the things that this is what our brains do. Our brains are pattern matching devices. They look for anything. They look for something in the clouds. Hey, that's Abraham Lincoln on a unicorn. Um, and so this is seeing meaning. So you know, one of them is seeing meaningful patterns and, and connections in meaningless data. Uh, uh, Pareidolia is, is having significance. Like, oh, this is not just uh, something that I see, but this has personal meaning. This is a message uh, to me uh, out of the ether. Um, and, and Michael Schremer, who's the, uh, the uh, I think he's the editor of Skeptic Magazine, he defined this term patternicity, which I think is the same thing, and only slightly easier to uh, pronounce. So we, we all see these things. So we see Mother Teresa in, uh, in a pastry, or we see you know, a man on the moon, which if you look at it under different lighting conditions, doesn't actually look like much of anything. So, but we really do see a face, and that's what our brain is wired to see, and that really is Mother Teresa. But it doesn't mean anything, and it certainly doesn't mean anything to me, except for the pastry. OK, so you're probably all wondering, hey, guys, we would like to have some fun with this stuff. So I'd like to set some ground rules. Uh, there are some things you can do that are tremendous amounts of fun, but I want to have people leaving here being good people. Uh, so there are places that you can go and things you can do that are, I think, fantastic. But I plead with you to be good people and to treat all the people that you interact with with honesty and dignity and allow them to have whatever the world is that is in their heads. Allow them the ability to have that. So please, be if you go to a psychic, be a good sitter. Be respectful and kind. Don't be a debunker. No one's going to win if you're trying to change their minds. That's what they do. Um, Truly, if you can do this, this is what makes it the best experience. Just believe in that moment that everything that they're saying is true. Whatever that belief system is, just go with it and pretend in your mind you'll have a much better time. Um, and again, just don't go as a, as a debunker. Uh, you can find good psychics on Yelp. <laughs> this is how I found some of the ones I went to. They are uh, you know, varying qualities. I went to the higher end ones because I wanted to see what the best were able to do and what sort of systems that they had. Uh, used. Yeah, you can go to a spiritualist church. There's one in San Francisco. There aren't many left. Uh, spiritualism is that, uh, that branch of religion that says that there's a scientific basis for people being able to communicate with the dead. And, and that's what they do there. So they do a lot of, uh, a lot of mediumship where they talk to uh, your, your uh, relatives who have passed on. Um, and then there's uh, different psychic schools around the Bay Area. And sometimes they have an open house. And you can actually visit many skeptics or many uh, uh, psychics. And, uh, and so there's a, there's a term that we use, and it's called closed eye. A closed eye is a psychic who closes his or her eyes and then tries to get the vibration. These, these folks will not be as good as, a, as frauds because they keep their eyes closed and they can't see when they're really screwing up. And so I went to one once, uh, and a friend of mine, uh, her father had just died, and the, and the psychic had closed his eyes, and he kept saying, your father likes this and your father likes that. And of course, her face immediately told everyone who had their eyes open, like, oh, no, that was a mistake. In which case, he could have shifted gears. He didn't. He completely screwed up. Yeah, so the reading list, by the way, uh, you know, just, just because if you want a psychic, Bob's available for, no, I'm kidding. Um, so these are some of the books that, that we have read between the two of us that we find awesome. Um, Full facts of books of cold reading by Ian Rowland. It's like that's a de facto cold reading standard. Like if you want to like just get cold reading straight out, passages we've gone over. Subliminal by Leonard uh, Muldau is actually more about the neurobiology behind the cognitive biases and why they function from an evolutionary perspective and what parts of your brain are actually doing it. In Sheep's Clothing is about um, some people who uh, are psychopaths and how psychopaths manipulate the world. And if you want to go for excellent cold readers, psychopaths are some of the best because they don't fit in with society, yet they do. Uh, incognito is another one of those how your subconscious brain influences your decision making. So it allows you to get some assets on that. Uh, Joe is actually a good friend of mine, uh, what everybody is saying. Uh, he started the FBI nonverbal research lab. So he's very good at nonverbals. Uh, Paul Ekman is responsible for all of the micro-reading or uh, subtle expressions, micro-expressions, etc. And Naked Mentalism by John Thompson. 
is a gigantic book of statistics that you could, it's like, it's just like literally, it's like if you find somebody who is 35 years old and male and lives here, here is a table of all the things that are the most likely to be, right? It's actually like, the, like I can tell you now, like everybody think of a color, right now everybody think of a color. Half of you thought of red. It's just, it, it's like, that's what it does. It's pretty amazing. It's all you, man, I'm good. Do you have any final thoughts? Anybody um, have any questions? The only other final, yeah, the final thought is just what I said before, which is that when you go out and you start exploring, please be good people and uh, that, that's really it. Don't, don't use these powers for evil. You really can use them for evil. Like, it's not, that's not a joke. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow.